This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft, and you're listening to episode 89. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Vitaly Katzenelson, CEO and CIO of IMA, which stands for Investment Management Associates, Inc. I came to know Vitaly by finding his profile on Twitter, and from there, I started reading his blog, listening to his podcast, and read a few of the available chapters of his book, and I knew I had to reach out to him to have him on. In this interview, we focus quite a bit on how the more you know yourself, then the more informed you'll be about what type of investing strategy and investor you will be. As Vitaly states in the interview, and I'm paraphrasing here, investing is like clothes shopping. You know, some, some will look great, but when you try them on, the clothing item may not fit right. You try on different clothing that looks good, and eventually you find what works for you. The goal for this episode is to learn how Vitaly looks inward, to understand what investing strategy would work best for him, you know, maybe this inspires you to look inward in order to help yourself become the best investor you can be. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 89, and please enjoy my interview with Vitaly Katzenelson. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hi, everyone. Robert Kraft here, your host on the Planet Microcap podcast. As some of you may know, when I'm not interviewing folks for the podcast, I also host CEO video interviews and Wall Street views with investing experts for SNN's YouTube channel, SNN Network. I wanted to take a moment to invite you all to subscribe to the SNN Network YouTube channel. As a subscriber, you'll be the first to be notified when we publish a new CEO video interview with microcap management teams, a new Wall Street View video interview with investing experts, panels and keynote presentations from our conferences, as well as new and archived podcast interviews. Go to www.youtube.com backslash SNN wire and click the subscribe button. Again, that's www.youtube.com backslash SNN wire and click subscribe. Thank you for subscribing and for your continued support. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I would like to welcome Vitaly Katzen Nelson, CEO and CIO of IMA USA. Vitaly, welcome to the Planet Microcap podcast. Robert, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this interview. And so to get started, uh, as I do normally on, on each episode, you know, let, let's start with your background. How, how'd you get your start in the world of finance and investing? Okay, well, so um, as your readers will, I mean, as your listeners will figure out in about a second, I was not born in uh, Texas. I, I actually, <laughs> Um, no, I, so I actually was born in Murmansk, Russia, and I grew up in the Soviet Russia, and I left uh, in 1991. So when I was in, in technical college, I was a horrible student, but the only class that I did fairly well was, was economics. Mm. And uh, at the time, if somebody told me that I will be doing stuff in the stock market, I would never believe them. Because at the time I thought stock market is basically, you know the pictures you see of uh, kind of of the old New York Stock Exchange where people are yelling and throwing papers? <laughs> kind of the, 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 the same pictures like when you think yep. about uh, that movie Trading Places and they were trading, oh, I forget, the orange futures or whatever, yeah. that kind of chaos. That's what I thought you know, investing was at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so um, we immigrated to the United States, to Denver, and um, I found that I, I'm also kind of a geeky, you know, so I was fairly good with computers. So I was going to college, and I think I was going through my third or fourth major, 
And this is kind of interesting. This is like mid nineties. And uh, at that time, O.J. Simpson trial was was really the trial of the century. Mm-hmm. And when you say that, actually, like today, people don't understand how big it was. So, like, you cannot watch any channel without like half of the programming was dedicated to O.J. Simpson's, right? Like CNBC after two o'clock switched to O.J. Simpson coverage. Anyway, so, so the point I'm trying to make is that. At the time, uh, that you know, I I thought, well, maybe I, want, I should you know, I should become a lawyer because I was you know you're watching so much legal TV, and uh, luckily um, I got a job uh, at an investment firm helping them with some with some programming and, and uh, computing stuff, and uh, they had a Bloomberg terminal and uh, portfolio managers were very nice people, and I kind of that's how I basically got introduced to investing. Mm-hmm. And uh, and at that point, I realized, oh my God, that's what I want to do. And so I switched my major to finance. Mm-hmm. And from that point on, ever you know, the kind of the road was very clear because mm-hmm. at that point, I knew, okay, I need to finish my undergraduate degree, get my master's in finance, and get my CFA. Mm-hmm. So I I was lucky that I you know that I kind of figured out what I want to do relatively early in my life, not like Warren Buffett when he was like eleven or something, but you know when I was twenty one or twenty two. So. I was, so, uh, I was in your same boat, same exact boat. I, I think I switched my majors like three, three, four times just in one year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, my son is eighteen, and he doesn't know, and he's going to, you know, he's he's going to go to school, you know, to university next year, right. and he has no idea what he wants to do. And I said, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, that's. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, we not. Dig- we digress. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, cool. So, um, so. To follow up, then from there, you know, you saw you saw the clear roadmap. So then from there, you know, what what was the first stop there? So you, you're probably studying for the, your CFA. You know, where where did you land first? So it's kind of interesting. I landed at IMA, the ah. firm that I run today. Actually, it's kind of interesting. So I was hired as a kind of a junior analyst mm-hmm. at IMA, and um, and uh, my partner, who's now my partner, Michael Khan, hired me. And, uh, you know, so that's that's where I started my career, basically, in 1997, like, you know, seriously, when I started my career in 1997. So I've been here for 22 years already. My God. Wow. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, yeah. You're, you know, you're, you know, the, if nothing else, anybody can learn from this interview, you know, you are, you're truly a long term uh, uh, investor and, and, uh, and holder, at the, you know, just by just by virtue of the fact that you've been at the same firm for 22 years. <laughs> uh, that's very true. very true. So, OK, so you're so you've been at the firm for 22 years. You know, it, it's it, did you going in? Did you have kind of some ideas of what you thought your investing thesis might be? Or did you come in kind of fresh like, all right, I know the basics. You know, now what do I what do I do with those basics? You know, did did IMA help shape that for you, or did you come in with kind of your own ideas? It's a great question. So um, here's what I learned over the years. Um, so when I when I when I joined IMA, IMA was kind of uh, what what you would call a growth at reasonable price. Mm-hmm. So we would buy high quality companies, and we would buy them at kind of reasonable valuation, not necessarily dirt cheap, but you know, you you basically think they're going to grow earnings, and they, you know they're going to pay a dividend, and that's how I get trained originally. But one thing I realized, what was you know, and it took me a few years to figure this out, but what was missing from that strategy was kind of margin of safety. Mm. And when I had that realization, in the instant I became a value investor, God. because that's you know, so that's a <laughs> kind of you know, so it's if you think about it, growth at reasonable price plus margin of safety kind of you know, could lead you to you know flavor of value investing. Right, right, right. Um, but one thing I also discovered is this, and I think your listeners may benefit from this. There are, you would listen to interviews of very, you know, different money managers and everyone has a different style. Mm-hmm. One thing, especially if you're young, one thing is important to understand is this. Your investment strategy is like your clothes. So the, this jacket may look good on somebody else, but, but but it may not look good. It may not feel right on you. So your strategy is gonna. When you start, you may, you know, especially if you're young, you may start with one strategy, and then over time, 
you may uh, tailor it to f tailor it to fit your biases, your uh, EQ and your IQ, and your strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so, and so so where do so where do we submit that uh, uh, that that analogy and quote now so that we can get uh, you can get credit for that you know uh, uh, fifty years from now because that is that's I think you just gave us the tagline for this whole interview just right there. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Right here. <laughs> yeah. No. No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. it's going to be from now on. So all right. Anyway, right. I, again, I digress. Please continue. Sorry about that. No, but I. So mm. just. Um, so yeah. So the, so the. I guess the point I want to make is this. Uh, and just let me just expand on this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered over the you know, over years over the years that. Okay, so when you own a company, when you know, when you own a when you own a stock, the, your decisions are only going to be as good as two things. Uh, basically, how well you know is how well you understand the business, which is your IQ, and how rational you are when you're making those decisions. And the good thing about when you when you invest in the stock market, you actually get to choose which companies you buy, right? So because you don't have to own every single company in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And so when you choose the companies you buy, you can say, I'm only going to buy companies that I understand extremely well. And, and this is as important, the companies that are, I'm at my most rational, you know, like I'm at the highest peak of my rationality when I own them. So I'll give you an example. For instance, I found that when I own uh, companies like gold miners or, or mining companies in general, kind of deeply cyclical companies whose who, whose uh, whose revenues are tied to commodity. I found that my EQ is very low. In other words, even if I understand the business, I will still probably the emotions will get the worst of me, and I'll probably buy high and sell low. So therefore, in my process. So now I understand this, this weakness I have. So I don't own gold miners or mining companies. And I found that uh, when I own high quality companies with a lot of cash, strong balance sheets and great management, when these companies decline 30, 50%, I sleep as well as I, you know, as I slept when they were, you know, you know 50, 50 or hundred percent higher. So mm -hmm. it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And, and therefore, and, uh, and you know, and actually, more more importantly, at times I would buy more if you know, if that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but that's something I discovered by just doing it by mm -hmm. by you know going through and making mistakes and learning. And, and my point is this: just like like just like tight clothing, um, your strategy you will discover what your true strategy is over time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just because you know this famous hedge uh, fund manager, or whatever, buying a stock. You know, it doesn't mean that that's the right stock for you. If it's, you know, like for if I don't know, if uh, David Tepper comes out and says he's going to buy this gold miner or whatever, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm not gonna, not even even going to look at it because I know that, you know, f for me that's not the right, you know, that's not the right stock. Mm -hmm. Well, it, what it sounds like that you did when when you were you're shaping your strategy and and pulling from different ideas as to and and seeing what works and doesn't work. Along with that, it also sounds like that you really wanted to do a deep dive internally and understand who you are as a person and, and, and how that relates to you as an investor. Because, you know, right there when you talked about, you know, knowing when you're going to be at your peak rationality so that you can make the best possible decisions for you is you went in and tried to understand your weaknesses, you know, just as a human. You know, and trying to make sure that that doesn't affect the way in which you trade and, and pick companies. I mean, was that pretty much where you were going with that too? That's right. But in a, in all fairness, I wish I understood it in the beginning. Sure. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I think just, you know, so I've been doing it for a long time, right? But, and so I obviously, when you're in a stock market, it's going to humble you very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, when, and therefore, it took me years and years to get to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, were you for you? Were you were you really falling into the trap? And and I talked about this on a podcast episode not that long ago. But you know, were you falling into the traps of you know different biases? You know, the recency bias and you know trend bias, all all those different things. I mean, I I, I find myself sometimes getting susceptible to those, even even still. 
you don't even realize it. It's a, it's another bias that just popped up. You're like, oh, the new bias, great. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> fall trapped to um, that one. I, I don't think I ever fell into trend bias because I usually have the other bias, like counter trend bias. Ah, I, good. You know, I, I, yeah, I contrarian usually, edge, right? Of yeah, course. that's right. Yes, yeah, so I usually <laughs> counter trend bias. But uh, no, I'm sure. Like you know, if I if I, listen, if I go, if I uh, if I recently lost my money, I'm just making this up on the grocery store. Then, because of that, maybe for the next six months or a year, it's going to be difficult for me to, you know, look at grocery stores. I'm just making this up, but that's, I'm sure I have these biases. Uh, well, yeah. No, I was, I was going to say, cause you know, for instance, you, you talked about, you know, how, uh, you know, let's say David Tepper came out, talked about some, mm-hmm. uh, gold miners or mining companies and, uh, uh, you know, you're like, okay, I know not to now pay attention to that, but you know, there might be some other, uh, you know, there's other thought process. Well, okay. If, let's say uh, most of the trend is, all right, we don't want to look at that space. And then now he comes out or someone comes out with, with more uh, news about that industry. You know, do you just know, is, is that some sort of bias for you? Or is that more of just, you know what, this is one of, part of my checklist now. You know, so it's not okay. a bias as, as opposed to it just saying, no, nah, I just don't deal with that industry. You know, you know okay. what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so actually, let me give you a better example. Okay, okay. So, okay. No, 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 sorry, this, this is kind of a more real example. Okay. So I found that I don't like owning you know, cyclical, like, uh, cyclical businesses mm-hmm. with great, you know, big balance sheets. Mm-hmm. And so I don't like owning airline companies. Okay. So, I like, so airline companies, I know that, I know that even if I get analysis right, I will be shaken out of the stock when something goes bad and something always will go bad. Just, you know, with something in your portfolio. And so therefore I made a decision that airline stocks, I might EQ, not IQ, but EQ is very low. Mm-hmm. And, and so then, I don't know, three or four years ago, Warren Buffett said that, you know, Warren Buffett forever was saying that he would never buy airline companies again because he lost some money in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And he was saying if you know if he ever buys an airline stock, how you know, ask him to call airline anonymous or something. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, but that was you know that, that was his joke. But and then three or four years ago, he bought three or four airlines. And uh, in you know, I have a tremendous respect for Warren Buffett. And uh, when he makes a decision like this, normally I would say, okay, I want to understand why he owned it why he bought it well i understood why he bought it actually this time uh, very quickly but and i and i saw the cheapness you know that he saw but i knew that my eq if i owned it would be low and therefore uh, that's where i stopped i did not you know we did not build financial models we did not do deeper research because i knew it doesn't matter so it doesn't matter what my analysis will tell me is if my eq is low then uh, then I'm just not gonna own airlines. Yeah. And maybe let me just uh, um, let me give you let me let me give you this formula. Uh, mm-hmm. And I know this is a podcast; you're not supposed to have formulas. But let's say your total. <laughs> so I'm I'm writing it down. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all, right, all right. So your total IQ is it just is it's a it's a it's it's a multiplication of your IQ times EQ, where EQ cannot be greater than one. So, so, so what is EQ? Real quick, not to, I didn't mean to yeah, cut you off, but, what, yeah. but for those who don't know, what does EQ stand for? Emotional quotient. Okay, yeah, gotcha. so, so in other words, let's say you are, when, I, when you analyze airlines, let's say you were airline, I don't know, let's say you understand airlines inside and out. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to airlines, your IQ is 130. Mm-hmm. But your EQ is 0.5. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it means you're an emotional wreck. Okay, <laughs> so... Okay, so 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 in other words, then your total IQ, you know, total IQ is going to be sixty five. Mm-hmm. So you probably should not own airlines. Mm-hmm. So okay. what, what's that on a scale of the the EQ? Oh, EQ uh, goes from zero to one. Zero it to one. Oh, gr- okay. It cannot be greater than one. So in other words, think about this: if you're hundred percent rational, mm-hmm. your total IQ will equal so 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 EQ will be one. Your total IQ will be equal your IQ, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're but if you're if you're less rational than one, and you're point nine, that is going to be you know, your total IQ is going to be point nine of your, you know, IQ. Mm-hmm. So so and I think that's very important to understand. Mm-hmm. What, 
you know, and I, and so in the, so understanding your weaknesses, your EQ weaknesses is very important in investing. How did you, how did you calculate your own EQ? I mean, are there tests out there? Do you go to a therapist? I mean, how, how do you, how do you figure it out for, for yourself? Well, that's it. So my EQ is going to be go very from company to company. Ah, okay. So my gold miners EQ is 0.3. <laughs> my, my, I don't know, drug stock EQ is 0.9. I see. So it's going to, it's going to, so this is what I, that's what I mean by your biases and your weaknesses. I so it's, so your EQ is going to vary from stock to stock. You are a computer programmer till you die. You are going to quantify that emotional intelligence. I love it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, all right. So, okay. So we've talked quite a bit now about, you know, the, the way in which you, 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 you look at, um, various potential invest kind of more or less just just from yeah. more of like a kind of a holistic standpoint so now you know i kind of want to dig right in on uh, ima's investment process and philosophy you know as it states on ima's w website you know it states that the company was built on the the six commandments of value investing plus one of your own so uh, so so what are they and why all right so the i basically took them out of the benjamin graham's intelligent investor and it's basic and i call them the six commandments uh the number one is a tricks treat stock as a business mm -hmm. number two have a long term time horizon number three the market is your servant not your master number th number four basically have margin of safety mm -hmm. or or in other words leave room for being wrong mm -hmm. um your true risk is a permanent loss of capital, uh, not volatility. And uh, and also, f number six, expect stocks to revert to their fair value in the long run. Mm -hmm. So those would be the kind of the, the kind of the, what I, you know, I call it the six commandments of value investing. Those kind of the principles of value investing, yeah. And what do I own? I, you know, I don't want to go too much into it, um, but... You know, I basically summed it up in my book, the in my in the active value investing. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, it's all these principles plus you basically you know it's the importance of self discipline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, you you want to be not just buy and forever hold investor. You want to be buy and sell investor. And the point I want to stress is that uh, uh, there was a kind of a buy and hold kind of became a religion. In investing, you know, in the value investing, you know, Warren Buffett owned Coke for 25 years or whatever. Um, but in reality, every, you know, at certain price, every company will become overvalued. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if Warren Buffett sold Coke in, I don't know, 1999, he probably would have been happier because for the last, whatever, uh, 19 years, it hasn't done anything. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, so that, you know, the active investing, you know, it puts the emphasis on the having a self discipline. Doesn't mean you have it. You know, you're trading. You know, you're trading. But you know, if I if I buy a company, let's say I bought a company and you know, and I think it's worth a hundred dollars and it's I bought it at fifty, and for sheer luck, it's went up hundred percent in one day. It never happened to me, but you know, let's say it did. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly it becomes fairly valued. So yes, my my I would I would sell it. You know, next mm -hmm. day again, never happened to me, but. Uh, you know, and then we own, we own some companies five or six or seven years. So mm -hmm. it's a, but it's a, is you know, and we haven't sold them because their fair value increased at a at a faster rate than their price. Mm -hmm. So when you're, so for instance, when you're looking at a potential new investment, you know, what what type of, you know, how do you calculate or what what's those, uh, the I guess the the moat or the um, the when you see when you're looking at the price of the stock, you know at, at what's what type of multiples are you looking at where you're then it it becomes interesting to you, you know, like are, yeah. are you looking at some as you know ten bagger, five bagger, you know, like what yeah. at what range then? Because that I think would give some perspective for some yeah. people as to like, all right, well, if that's what you're looking for, then okay, that makes sense. Like if once it gets there, all right, you have the discipline to sell, go for it. You know what I mean? So what what is yeah. that range? Yeah. So when we analyze companies, we always value them what they're worth about four years from now. Got it. Because we thought three is too short, five is too long, so we settled on four. Um, and uh, we figure out what they're worth. And then for us, 
for us uh, to be interested in them, we need a rate of return somewhere between 15 to 25% mm -hmm. annual rate of return. And that would include dividends. So in other words, you know, you can get into the you know, discount you, you, know, you want to pay for today. So in other words, you know, it's a probably it has to double, but, you know, it has to double in four years, roughly, you know, double to more in four years for us to be interested in that. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, that actually gets into the, some of the process that you talk about on your website, you know, cause it, it's one thing to find the good business. You know, you do your, you do the, the forecasting, you see, you, you look out four years, you see if you'll get that rate of return also with dividends, you know, at, at what's next, you know, when, when do you have to recalculate that formula? Is it at a point when you see that it's dipped below that 15 to 20%, 25% uh, return return on uh, that that you didn't see, you know, at, at what point do you then kind of uh, once you start building your position, then have to take a step back and say, okay, wait, they didn't return what I thought, but yeah. you know, it's still kind of following along the trend that we had forecasted. Yeah. So I call here what we do is kind of an analytical factory. Okay. And the reason I call it analytical factory because I want us to think about what we do as a kind of uh, as a process. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a kind of very systematized process. So obviously, this is not an exact science, and you have to make a lot of assumptions and there are a lot of soft elements uh, in this business. So we value this company, you know, on day one. Like when we, when we analyze it, is say we figure out, okay, it's worth $100 or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, four years out. And then here are our, here are our assumptions. And then as time goes by, we have more information, new information, and then we and then we get to get to uh, either using that you know those you know the, that new information we can say well, okay I think we were too optimistic, too pessimistic, or because of this information maybe uh, something happened and they sold the division for a greater price than we thought you know originally it was, it was worth. So we'll say maybe it's worth one ten, mm -hmm. and so and for every company in the portfolio, we have expected rate of return based on if you know just what it's worth from you know four years from now, and uh, and you know the closer it gets to the fair value, the less interesting it becomes. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, and, gotcha. All right, so I want to I want to dig into your book a little bit because I and actually both of your books um, mm -hmm. because uh, you actually you talk a lot about your strategy and your process mm -hmm. in there as well. You know, so um, in the first book, as you said, you know, uh, uh, we we were. You know, you you talked about active value investing. Your first book. You know, in, in this one, what what was the the thesis there? You know, and and firstly, what what are and I quote range bound markets and and how do you make money in them? Okay, so okay, so um, I start. So it, you got to give you. Uh, um, I got to give you historical backdrop. Good, let's go. I start. I started to work on this book in two thousand five. Mm -hmm. And it took me almost almost two years to write it, maybe eighteen months, eighteen months or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that book had a, I don't know, seventy five charts and tables, and it's a two hundred eighty pages. And uh, it was it was published by Wiley, mm -hmm. and it's going to become important in, in about a second. Um, so anyway, so the in the book, I'm basically I was making a case that in two thousand, from nineteen ninety two to two thousand, we had a what I call well. Was secular bull market, you know, uh, and uh, and at the, at the historically at the end of bull market, when you had a long lasting bull market, the market that followed, and that, again secular means long term, five years or longer, it, uh, is going to be a side uh, range bound market, you know, a so market that goes up and down, but really goes nowhere, mm -hmm. and I and again uh, so the when I'm talking about long term, not three years, I'm thinking about five years or longer, and I was thinking ten years or longer actually. Uh, and uh, the reason that happens because at the end of the bull market, stocks become expensive mm -hmm. and the price earnings become high. Mm -hmm. And if you think about long-term return for stocks, and I'm going to ignore dividends for a second, um, they like stock prices go up in the long run because you know for two reasons: either earnings are growing, or price earnings going up or down, or a combination of both. So historically. If, if price earnings was remained constant at 15 times earnings, if stocks never changed price earnings but always were at 15 times earnings, mm -hmm. stocks would go up about 6% a year, hmm. which is basically growth of earnings, mm -hmm. which is very similar to GDP growth over the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. And then you had an, you got another 4 four to 5% from dividends. 
So that's so the, the but the the reason you have this uh, kind of sideways you know bull markets and uh, range bound or sideways markets because when price turnings get high and then the bull market uh, they you know, they start being reverting they go from above average level through average to below average mm-hmm. and historically like we had a you know, sideways market from 66 to 82, that's exactly what happened. Stocks went from above average to below average, and they stayed there for a while. And, you know, and you basically, if you bought stocks in 66, uh, for 16 years, you know, they went up and down. You had, I forget, five or six bull markets and bear markets inside of them. And you made very little money. You basically made no real returns. Mm-hmm. Uh, you collected dividends, but all of those returns were eaten up by, by inflation. So you made almost no real returns. Uh, mm-hmm. um, so that was the thesis of my active value investing. And that was about one third of the book. Mm-hmm. And then two thirds of the book was basically kind of talking about my value investment strategy. That's why it's called active value investing. And then in 2010, about three years later, after the book was published, John Wiley and Sons came to me and said, Vitaly, we have this uh, series called The Little Books Off. And there was like 20 or 30 books in that series. And, you know, John Bogle wrote one and uh, John Morden wrote one. And they said, if you just, you know, it would be great if you just took your book, simplified it, mm-hmm. and uh, wrote it for, instead of for being addressed in kind of professional investor market, for your neighborhood dentist. So, you know, so, so I basically took me about three or four months, but I just uh, took my, cut my book basically in half. Mm-hmm. And uh, instead of seventy-five charts and tables, I think that three or four. Mm-hmm. So it's it's basically, actually, it's kind of I'm I'm lucky because most authors don't have the chance. It's like when you write a book for the second time, and that's what I would argue I did for, you know, for the most part. Um, you get to uh, you get to say things better, mm-hmm. and you can you know, you find a new way to say it, and you find better way to say it. So I. You know, as an as an author, I like my little book better mm-hmm. for that reason because I think it's just yeah you know, I had a, a second chance to kind of improve it. Got it. So you, um, so my next question then is, and you cover this in both books. You know, obviously in the first third, and then also in uh, the little the the little book of sideways markets. And and my question here is is then how do you make money in these markets you know you recognize there's this trend where you know you get above average uh, uh pe's and then you kind of start you start to see a reversion to the mean so what was your your findings and your advice and the way in which you know for you you were able to make money then when you notice when you've seen this trend yeah so let me just make two comments which i think sure. are very important okay number one the in the first book i call this markets range bound markets mm-hmm. But the problem is when I was doing a lot of media interviews, I kept asking, kept getting asked the same question. So what is that range? Because range kind of assumes there's right. a bottom and, you know, and I realized that's a, a little bit imprecise definition. It's more like sideways because, mm-hmm. you know, so, so because sideways, uh, sideways just basically means it's going up and down. But, you know, so the. I changed the name of the book of this markets to from range bound to sideways. I, I, had, a, the, I had a feeling that was what the it, it it meant the same thing, but I but yeah no yeah. sorry that that makes yeah, a lot no, of sense. That's number one. Number two, I would, so if you read books these books today, um, you would see that my predictions were wrong mm-hmm. because I basically expected the markets to kind of be sideways. Well, we broke through. We, you know, we we had a ten-year bull market, secular, like now by definition, a secular bull market uh, from 2008. Mm-hmm. So, one thing I did not expect, I did not expect interest rates to decline to zero or negative interest rates in, in some countries and stay at this level for as long as they have. Mm-hmm. And that basically has changed, like, you know, uh, on the information I had when I was writing those books, I I would still write the same book. But what what has changed the interest rate environment from from normal to kind of freaky environment where we have a you know four or five percent GDP growth and we still have interest rates that are two or three mm-hmm. percent and uh, so I would argue that the thesis of my books were, was accurate except it didn't account for interest rates and I would argue that my books are actually more valuable today 
than they were when I wrote them because valuations today are we are kind of we are at 99 level again or mm-hmm. close to it. Mm-hmm. So uh, so they are, from that persp- so from that perspective, uh, I should just literally just say you know just put you know say a little. Uh, the the little book of sideways markets too, and not change your word in the book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, and and it's you know, and I'll sell a lot of copies. But, no, it, uh, should, it should be the little the little book of sideways markets for rational actors. <laughs> yeah, <it laughs> like can, if it, yeah, like if it's no. if it's supposed to go the way it probably should have, then this is what I would do, right? Like I mean, yes, uh, yes. No, but I, if you look at the stock market today, and I and I'm not, I know I'm not answering your question. We'll come back to it. No, no, but if cool. you look at the stock market today, any measure you look at, we are trading at the levels that's uh, that's basically comparable to 1929 or 1999. Mm-hmm. So, and you know how that ended at some point. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, I'll give, I'll give you this. Everybody's excited about the economy. So last year, I think economy grew either five, I think 5.3%, which is a you know, fairly good growth rate for an economy, except our government debt went up by 7%. Mm-hmm. And so, so in other words, if you think about it, our Economy actually shrunk by one point, you know, by one point seven percent. Then, because all of the growth was basically in the economy was because we borrowed, we borrowed over a trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. So, because you know, when you when you borrow money, it's stimulative for the economy. Mm-hmm. And so, when your debt is growing to seven percent, your economy is growing five point three. It means your your you know, if if you if the you know if the government did not borrow any money, the economy probably would have shrunk. So just just the side point. Um, so your strategy, you know. So but the, the but the strategy, you know, what's the active value investing strategy, is you know all these principles that you and I talked about, you know, this uh, the six core principles, plus uh, a couple more. So if number one, self discipline. Number two, you want to be very careful with relative valuations. And uh, let me explain what I mean. Let's say. Uh, you're looking at you know, you're looking um, you're looking at the stock market and you see this one company trades at 22 times earnings, mm-hmm. okay, and you say, well, it used to trade at 35, so now it's cheap. Well, this you know the the you know the past valuations may or may not continue in the future. So in other words, if it you know it, a lot of times stocks overvalued at the end of the bull markets. And just because they appear to be cheap today relative to the past, it doesn't mean it's actually cheap. So you want to use more absolute valuation tools. In other words, figure out what the business is actually worth. And maybe you'll find out that at the end it's actually worth maybe 16 or 17 times earnings. Mm -hmm. And yes, maybe 22 times earnings is cheap relative to the whatever, 30 plus times earnings I traded three years ago. But in the context, uh, but the problem is if you're going from, if you have a PE compression, Mm -hmm. then... Then, well, you know, then you may get into kind of relative valuation trap. That would be point number one. Point number two, and this would not be your friend if for the last ten years, you should be will. If you cannot find stocks that you know kind of fit your criteria, you hold cash, mm-hmm. and cash should be better than an overvalued stock or a company that's a kind of a low quality company. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that would be. That would be another element of active value investment strategy, and okay. there are more. But I, you know, yeah. And 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 those those are principles that, for you, you use in in any market, or is that specific to when it's uh, as as you say the sideways markets? I think the cash becomes more important in the sideways markets, mm-hmm. and I think the relative valuations become more important in the sideways markets as well. Yeah. Got it. Uh, so those kind of a kind of slight modifiers to a strategy, I guess. Got it. You know, it, continuing on with your strategy in 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 the book in, in active value investing that book, you know, you also introduced this uh, quality valuation and growth framework. You know, let let's yeah. dive in and, and learn a little bit more about this. Sure. So when we look at companies, we le- kind of we look at the company from three dimensions. You know, mm-hmm. so number one, quality. Mm-hmm. What does the quality mean to us? Uh, on the high level, it means three things. Uh, it's basically business, balance sheet, and management. Business, you want to have a company that has a significant competitive advantage, high recurrence of revenue, significant tailwind behind it, um, easy to understand and transparent. Um, on the balance sheet side, we basically, we usually want to own companies that 
to have a very good balance sheet. And it's a, there is no, uh, so for some companies, that means they're going to have a net cash position. For some companies, they're going to have a, uh, just a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then management, basically, we want management to be good at two things. We want them to be good at running the business and also to be good capital allocators. Mm-hmm. So if you have all this, all these three kind of three elements, you know, kind of uh, uh, a balance sheet. I mean, it's a, a business balance sheet and management. You got a you got a high quality company. Mm-hmm. Another definition of high quality company, and this one is came from Warren Buffett. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little bit more ambiguous, but but I think it's actually more important, even more important than what I just described. A company that you would you could comfortably own. If the stock market was closed for 10 years, mm. just, th- just think about this. This is a very important because from your mindset perspective, when you analyze a company, um, the stock market, just because you can sell it tomorrow, it may, sh- it may short circuit some of your analysis because you're thinking, well, I can always dump it tomorrow. Well, if you approach it that what if I can't sell it for the next 10 years, would I want to be in this business? Mm-hmm that suddenly changes your analysis completely. Mm-hmm. And so this is, I always have it in the back of my mind when we buy stocks, uh, would I want to own them if I could not sell them for 10 years? You know, in the, in the micro cap game, we're just, will they be around in 10 years, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So that's funny. Cool. Okay. So, so those, those are the, the three main frameworks that you, that you work around. You know, another thing I, I love asking my, my guests on here too is, you know, once we have, you have the strategy in place, you know what you're looking for, you know, your criteria, you've done your due diligence, you've talked with management. Um, you know, how do you size into a position then? You know, do you, do you buy a third at a time? You know, you wait to see if they perform, they perform, you buy your next third, you know, what, what's your strategy around that? Got it. Um, so let me, I did not finish answering your previous question, but then oh. I'll answer this one. Yeah, because you asked me for quality valuation growth. So I talk about sure. quality. Yes. <laughs> so the, so growth is going to be a function of two things. It's really earnings growth and dividends. Okay. And it's important to put value in dividends because if I want a company that's growing earnings, I don't know, 6% a year and they pay me 5% dividend, my growth actually is 11%. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's an important factor. And then, so if you put quality and growth together, you get, you know, then that makes it a good company. Mm-hmm. And you can always, there are always a lot of great companies in any market. The trick is to get, to get a good stock, which is basically uh, you want to buy th- this company, you know, these great companies at discount t- to what they're worth. Mm-hmm. And that's where valuation comes in. Mm-hmm. And so to answer your next question, the way we look at uh, buying stocks our position sizing, number one, is going to be a function of company's quality. The higher the quality of the company, the greater, the larger position size mm-hmm. it's going to be. And it's also going to be a function of company's valuation. So the, so it's a combination of these two. So it's the, the higher the quality company, the cheaper it is, mm-hmm. the more capital it should get, mm-hmm. right? The lower the quality company, again, it's relative to the high quality. And the more expensive it is, the sh- smaller position it should be. Mm-hmm. And so for every company in the portfolio, we basically have uh, pr- uh, target prices at which we would want to buy more if stock price declined to that price. Got it. Got it. Okay. I see what you're saying. So, you know, I- I'd be remiss, and, and, um, and I'll follow up on this in a second, but, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask because, you know, this is a small micro nano cap focused podcast, you know, I, I just have to ask, have you ever dipped your toes in that market? And if so, you know, did your strategy change when you looked at companies, 1 billion in market cap or less versus your maybe large cap strategy? Okay. Uh, so what's the definition of nano cap? Uh, because this is oh, fluid, fi- fluid. Uh, 50 million in market cap or less. Okay. So I never bought a nano cap. Okay. Yeah. But I, but I, but we, we owned uh, quite a few, Companies that you know had a few hundred million dollars in market cap. Mm-hmm. So is that a what would it be your definition of that? Because I so micro my, micro we define as a fifty to five hundred million in market cap, and then a small cap uh, five hundred million to a billion in, in market. Okay, cap. so I guess I own the uh, kind of uh, small caps and maybe micro caps at times. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
So, so did, has your strategy changed then when you when you own those versus maybe your your larger cap strategy? You know, how how, how do you think about that? So you know what's kind of interesting. I think I found that analysis of management it becomes slightly different. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to use this company that we actually own in the portfolio for just illustrative purposes. Like we own McKesson, which mm-hmm. is a large, it's a you know, company has $200 billion of sales, right? You know, mm-hmm. It's a drug distributor. It's kind of a oligopoly. Three companies control the whole market. So when I analyze the company, analyze the management, I spend less time on thinking about how well they run the company versus how, how they allocate capital, that management. Mm. Because it's very difficult to, it's very difficult for management to really mismanage the company of that size, mm-hmm. you know, when it has a such a strong position. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's right. difficult. Mm-hmm. It's but it's difficult. So you can, but you can destroy huge amount of capital by uh, me, uh, capital misallocation. Mm-hmm. So it's okay. So when you look at um, s- uh, smaller companies. Uh, management has a uh, bigger impact, and I'm, I'm generalizing, um, on uh, how, they, uh, how they manage the business. Mm-hmm. Because they don't have the kind of the layers of bureaucracy, you know, kind of the, the, mach- the machine is leaner. So the, the management has a much, more, uh, much greater impact on how, how well the, run, uh, the company is run. Mm-hmm. So for that company, I would spend even uh, more time focusing on uh, how well, you know, the management runs, you know, runs the business. So it's a that would be kind of a distinction, but the rest is the same. I kind of I I to me value, you know, kind of you can find. Um, I'll give you an example. We own a company that I think when we bought it was a, a small cap, which is an IT company in Norway. Mm-hmm. Okay, but they are they had a thirty five percent market share, and Norway has population I don't know four or five million people. Mm-hmm. And so, and actually in Scandinavia, so I shouldn't say just Norway. Mm. And so they were like, they, they had a dominant market, dominant market share in Scandinavia. And because the market size, they were very dominant. So I would argue that company was less risky than a company that's maybe five or 10 times larger in the United States because, you know, in a similar business, because their competitive position was so much stronger in that tiny market. Right. Cool. So uh, my next question then, and, and, and this is one of my, my favorite question. I, I was going to get into the, to, you know, your sell, selling strategy, but you actually kind of covered that a little bit earlier in the interview when mm-hmm. you talked about it. Um, so I, I'm going to move forward with, with my next question, which again is it's one of my favorites. And uh, what, what would you say is an investing experience that, that shaped your current investing thesis? You know, mo- most people say it was a loss, but uh, you know, who knows? It could have been a gain for you. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be very original. <laughs> um, uh, no, I think loss is, um, well, it's combination. It's a, it's a losses, and uh, but okay, so it's losses, and also when we, also when we sold too soon, mm. um, and so low, but but basically. Pain is, I think, is the biggest shaper. Like it's the most important. Like I wrote a 15-page article, which I haven't shared with anybody, and probably not going to share it for a long time. Where I basically talked about how, you know some of my painful experiences as an investor, mm-hmm. and how uh, those experiences should not be wasted, mm-hmm. because when you when you when you go through painful years. Uh, if you actually kind of tap into that pain and, and learn and, and try to learn from your experiences, next time it's going to be less painful. Mm-hmm. And also, it's going to make you a better investor. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to be very, you know, and probably it's not, uh, um, while you're going through that, probably not the right time to tap into pain. Maybe just you got to wait a little mm-hmm. because it's very difficult to be, introspective while you're going through that right uh it's easier to do it when the when the pain is a little bit you know kind of a little bit behind you um but i think that uh you know the any investor any investor who is honest and who is you know who is honest has has had painful experiences 
uh, there was a there was a great book by uh, and I'm 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 going blank. Uh, it's called There's Always Something to Do, and it's by Peter and I going blank on the last on like his last name. He was kind of the Warren Buffett of Canada. In mm-hmm. fact, when Warren Buffett was looking for money manager, you know, before he tar- he hired uh, uh, Ted and Todd, he went to. Peter and I'm, I'm I'm going blank on his name and asked him if he would want to run Berkshire's money, and at the time uh, he had a uh, cancer, so he declined. But anyway, so this incredible investor who had a track record only for 30 years that was as good as Buffett's, he had a three or four miserable years in the early 90s, mm-hmm. and in that book he details you know that book uh, there's always something to do. What's great about that book is basically put together from his journals. Mm. And so 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 you can actually feel the pain on the pages of the book mm-hmm. where he was a short Japanese bubble stocks in 1988. Mm-hmm. And it took and, and it took 3 years for the you know Japanese bubble to collapse. And you know you can you can just you can just read you know you read this book and you read the pain uh uh, P- Peter Kandil. Now I remember P- Peter Kandil, phenomenal, you know, Canadian investor. And the book is the there is always something to do. So you can read the pain on those pages. And I know, like after you, you know, that those years has have helped to shape him as an investor. It made him a better investor. It's almost like a like you need pain. Um, like in the what happens is this. So in during, when you have a when you're doing well, your processes become looser, mm-hmm. okay? And uh, when you go through pain, it's almost like your instrument becomes out of, you know, so be, uh, when, you, when you're doing great, your instrument, mm-hmm. let's say it's a violin, a cello, a piano, is become looser and out of tune. Mm-hmm. But you don't know this because you're making money. Uh, at the time when you go through pain, it's a kind of, it's a basically that pain tunes your instrument again. Mm-hmm. And you improve your processes. So I'm a better, much better investor now than I was before, thanks to pain. I, I mean, if only Dostoevsky or uh, Chekhov wrote a, a were investors, I think they would there would be a great book in, or play about uh, investing out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I yeah, I, I literally wrote a uh, I wrote a very long kind of essay that I had to write for myself. And I, after I wrote it, I realized, okay, I'm not, I'm not ready to publish it yet. Uh, you, you, can you share, can you share a, a, maybe one story, if you want? You, know, yeah, uh, yeah. you got one anecdote in there that, uh, that you might want to share? Um, well, uh, 2013, okay. I think, was, the, like, was that year for us, I think, one of the years. I think every single decision I, I made seemed wrong like yeah you know, i bought a stock and two days after it declined 15 percent mm. and i would sell a stock and three days later it would go up 30 percent and and you know and i would add more money to the stock and declines lower and uh, into the so it's just and the market i forget market was marching higher at the time so it just you know and uh we had some stocks get cut by half and i i remember that we owned electronic cards and i think we bought it at I forget that six uh it's sixteen dollars or something like that, and it declined to thirteen. We added more to that and it went to ten, so it just was down forty percent in like in a matter of a few months and i this was may twenty thirteen and I was spoke maybe twenty five maybe twenty twelve or twenty thirteen I was speaking at a conference in san francisco a value conference, and I remember when I was you know uh electronic arts was my stock page. Mm-hmm. And I remember psychologically when I was giving the speech, I was so fragile because like the news from this company of previous three months was just horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget, they were developing Star Wars game and they they, they took a $500 million write-off because that was a failure. And there was another game that was, uh, you know, uh, uh, gamers were not happy about, etc. Long story short, I was develop- I, I was de- delivering this uh, presentation. And I remember that how sensitive I was. If somebody like I was hoping somebody would not ask me anything like, so how 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 is it going for you? Kind of this kind of question. Right. Anyway, so <laughs> long story short, long story short, it's a it, it's a hundred thirty dollars stock today or something like that. So it's a it was a you know it's but you know so it was a painful experience for 
you know, six months. And actually, the funny part was this. The stock that also at the time I did not buy because I thought electronic arts, which makes video games, would make the company obsolete in the long run would be GameStop. And, and another company at the time we looked at was Mattel. And I thought that, you know, can games compete with those in the long run? Anyway, so long story short, the, we bought electronic cars that declined 40%, 50%. Mattel doubled, over, uh, and uh, uh, GameStop doubled as well. And uh, so over six or eight, you know, six months or a year. And then now Mattel is probably down 70% since, and uh, GameStop is down probably 80% since, you know, mm-hmm. since. And... Uh, Electronic arts is up, I don't know, eight to tenfold. So, mm-hmm. uh, but it's important to well investors realize, to Asian investors, that we're all going to go through experiences like that. And in the short run, stock market, what the stocks, what my stocks going to do is completely, completely random, mm-hmm. and that's something we have to accept. Mm-hmm. If you, otherwise, just don't be in stocks. You should not be investing in the stock market if, if you don't, you know, if you don't understand that in the short run. The news flow is completely random, and what your stocks will do is completely, completely random. Mm-hmm. So, Vitaly, uh, just real quick, you know, I uh, uh, wanted to recap here for full disclosure. Do you do you own? Do you still own or, or have no. owned Electronic Arts, GameStop, or Mattel? N- none of them. So Got it. We don't own. Yep. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, my last question then for you is, you know, and and you've you've given so much advice, and and uh, I've really appreciated your your openness with with us today, and you know, but for new investors, you know, people that might be looking at the stock market for the first time today or tomorrow, you know, what what advice do you have for them? Oh my God, this is a, such a layup. I just wrote it. <laughs> I just wrote. I just wrote a lot. I just wrote an article, a letter to a young investor, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so is that okay if just instead of summarizing the article, I just direct people to my website to read this because you know, I'll, it's, I'll, it's, put the, I'll put the I'm link so in there for sure. I'm so much smarter on paper than I'm on the, on the microphone. Uh, uh, but basically, uh, let, me, let me just bring up so I can just give you the highlights. Uh, tells that. And you're, not, yeah, but, and you're not giving yourself enough credit. I, I've learned quite a bit today. You should see my paper. I have, I have a ton of notes right now. All right, let me, I'm going to bring up the kind of the, give you some points because I, so what we were looking, so I'll, I'll tell you how that article came about. We were looking to hire a junior analyst. Mm-hmm. Uh, over the years, we used maybe 20 or 30 interns. We had maybe 20 or 30 interns. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to figure out what makes a good intern, what makes a not so good intern. And a common denominator I found was passion. Mm. If um, like just like in basketball, you cannot teach height. In investing, you cannot really teach passion. Either you have it or you don't. And a lot of times in investing, you get discouraged. Sometimes you have to grind through a lot of numbers, do a lot of reading. And if you don't have a true passion for investing, then it can be very difficult for you to do well because you'll be competing against people that do have that passion. Mm-hmm. And um, so when we were looking for an analyst this time around, I was thinking, how could I, you know, kind of uh, filter analysts, you know, the applicants by passion? So what we did, we basically uh, asked the applicant to submit me a list of books they read over the last 12 months, mm-hmm. uh, write me an essay about three books that impacted them the most, three people that impacted them the most, dead or alive, uh, ask them to send me a write-up about uh, of their, their favorite stock, and I, there was something else too. And uh, so it's kind of interesting. We got 60 applications. Only only 13, 12 or 13 actually qualified you know, because the other 40-something just sent us their resume and cover letter that said, I am awesome, hire me. So we ignored them completely. Mm-hmm. But those 13 candidates actually did the work. And um, so after the... Like after we hired the person, I kind of felt guilty because I just, you know, I just made those people spend 10 or 20 hours uh, applying for this job. So I emailed them. I said, I'm, you know, I, as, as a payback for, you know, as a payback for your time, I'd be happy to talk to you on the phone or in person uh, to provide you any, any advice you want. And I also, I realized, well, the best way for me to be able to actually give them advice is to write about it first. Mm-hmm. So this is how this the letter to young investor came about. And um, I was basically writing to myself 20-something years ago because I realized when I got out of school, I was completely clueless. Um, 
but let me give you just a few highlights. Mm -hmm. uh, number one is that you need to find yourself. And you and I already talked about how your strategy has to fit you. And that's, that's, that's where it came from. So, you know, that's, that's, so that's very important. Um, just do it. That would be another point. So if you want to become an investor, uh, creating the model portfolio is not enough. The investing is a lot more is 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 a very is a psychological it's a lot is a, is a, as psychological as it is uh, analytical. So the only reason you'll be able to tap into your psychological you know kind of figure out what your EQ is when it comes to different companies, for instance, is by actually buying stocks and making money and losing money. So if you're a young investor, take as much money as you can afford to lose, mm -hmm. and do research as if you were buying the whole company. Do your, your serious research, and uh, and and and, and uh, start buying stocks. Don't think of it as a kind of you're trying to build a portfolio of stocks, because at this point you're not trying to kind of build a diversified portfolio. Mm -hmm. What you're trying to do, you're trying to learn analytical skills. Mm -hmm. So it's especially if you if you are young, it's very difficult to track, like to really stay on top of 20, 30 stocks. Uh, so I would recommend just pick, you know, just again, take as much money as you can afford to lose. Think of it as your tuition mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, uh, just, you know, just buy a handful of stocks and, you know, and follow them. And more, as importantly, when you buy a company, write out your thesis, why you bought it mm -hmm. and over time, update your thesis. Mm -hmm. And when you sell, you know, write out why you sold it. And the reason it becomes important is for another reason. If you end up looking for a job and you are competing against other candidates, then you're going to be in a situation where other candidates will be sending out cover letters saying, you know, hire me, I'm great. You'll be sending out your resource reports saying, here's the companies I own. Here's why I own them. Here's my process of ownership. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the history of my ownership. Here's why I bought it. You know, here's, you know, and. So you're going to have something else to offer that nobody else does. The person we hired actually had that. He sent me uh, write-ups of five companies he analyzed over the years. And uh, that I just read his write-ups and, you know, he had them at, the, at those write-ups, you know. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, Vitaly, I, I have to say th thank you so much for, for all of your, your, your candor and, and your work. You know, I mean, it's it's not just it's not just the work that you've done on uh, on the investing side and and developing your own theses, but you know, you really it's it really sounds like you dove deep, you know, internally, personally, and have been providing a lot of really great educational materials for uh, young investors or just any investor who who wants to understand what it's like in the real world and 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 from those yeah. experiences. So, so thank you for that, and and thank you for being on here and. Uh, uh, wh where can my audience go and find more information about you, IMA, and Contrarian? All right, let me pitch my podcast, which is ah, not like there we go. It's, Let's it, get it's it. Not, it's it, like you have a real podcast. Stop! I have a, come on, <laughs> I have what they call audio, audio articles. No, but um, but on a serious note, so my articles can be found on Contrarian Edge, e d g e dot com. Contrarian Edge. My podcast is basically just think of my articles being read to you by a professional actor or reader uh, you should uh, read them come on i yeah no it's you know it, actually we were thinking about it and i realized i don't i just don't have the time and i don't enjoy it as much mm. so uh that's why i become a professional do this and you know and i spend zero energy on that um uh, and I, they can find them on investor.fm mm -hmm. if you go you know so you can get investor.fm and you can uh, subscribe to my podcasts, uh, to you know, to my articles, basically audio articles. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, my company's website is imausa.com. Mm -hmm. imausa.com. And what what's the name of the podcast? Uh, in the intell the intellectual investor. Cool. And can uh, people find you on Twitter as well? Uh, yes, it's a Vitali K V I T A L I Y and letter K. Perfect. Vita yeah. Perfect. Vitaly, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, look forward to chatting with you soon. Robert, I really enjoyed it. You asked some very good questions. It really was a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast and thank you, Vitaly, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast. Go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast 
or on Stitcher, Spotify, or anywhere you can get podcasts, you'll be able to find and search for Planet Microcap Podcast, which includes iTunes. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap Podcast, where we'll have our next guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of stocknewsnow.com, the official microcap news source, and the Microcap Review Magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap Podcast. Have a great day.